Um, I think most of us know that technology is a little resistant to us. Um, so in any case, I'm very relieved that this is working. Uh, we'll start with that. Uh, I want to thank you also for the invitation. Um, what I've decided to do today is talk a little bit more about the historical perspective, just so to show some of the background of where this material is coming from. I think most of you are probably very engaged with possible futures and how to shape those possible futures. Um, I feel that my role often as a theorist is to show the long-term lines, the underlying foundations that actually are not so dissimilar from what we're struggling with today. And I find that often there are if not answers, at least some kind of reflections that we can find through this. Um, yeah, let me see if I can. So to start with, if I can get this to work, I actually, uh, Marina started with this, um, but I'd like to just show <laughs> with the feedback between mechanical systems and physical material natural systems. Indeed, Gideon was complaining about mechanization taking command, but in fact, Rainer Banham already in the 1960s, very early following this, was suggesting that the first wave of industrialization was taken the wrong way. We were taking the machine and trying to fit our bodies to this. This factory line that Charlie Chaplin is on just keeps going, whether or not that fly lands or whether he's in discussion with somebody else or is itchy on his arm, it will keep going, and he was meant to adapt. The small stills from men with a movie camera take on this heroic image of modernism and have someone running through Russia with a camera showing all the brilliant modes of industrial fabrication. The machine is a metaphor, but it also structures our body, whether it's Neufert discussing what the ideal map of surfaces are for the human body, or Le Bourget realizing our size, which of course by now is unbelievably outdated given current developments in height. We are trying to structure ourselves according to machines. The Situationist International, a group that Constant was working with, produced these pamphlets, very fierce student-based pamphlets, that actually reflected to us what was going on in the world. The secretary being so thrilled with her new typewriter. That's all we really care about. And so what we did in the 60s was we kind of took a new approach. This is what Banham did. He said what we need to stop looking at is mechanization in itself. We need to stop fitting ourselves to the machine. We need to have our machines fitting us. We need to start taking on technology as a sensibility and not as something to be achieved ourselves. Now, Banham was the critical voice for a group named Archigram, fairly well known in architecture, boys with toys, young, excited, and cool. It's all the same. This was one of their first pamphlets, number three, where they start looking at things like um, uh, laundry detergent, 
igloos, motorhomes, as all part of the same principle of expendability. They helped us look at science fiction films in order to be able to think about the possible futures that all of a sudden became exciting and glamorous. They introduced things like the control board. Cybernetics was a very young field, starting about 48, 49. And the very fundamental nature of feedback loops, our systems actually responding to transforming conditions, the beginnings of computer algorithms. And at that point, it was romantic. I mean, these computers that we now have in our pockets could take up a whole building. Now, for Archigram, what this meant was taking on a new approach to mechanization. We, don't look, we no longer have the factory line, but we have what we call control or choice. We have cybernetic systems and switches that we can turn on or off. We can raise the temperature, we can dim the temperature. We are here in the home of Philips. We can do anything with lighting these days. And that was started as early as this. Now this led to very large and grandiose schemes. The idea that our cities would no longer become cities, but they would become organisms. They would walk across the globe. They even appealed to organic structures, to the idea of insects almost. Whether they were in Manhattan or in the Sahara, didn't really matter. Only the interesting thing is at that time, we still were kind of in the original industrial paradigm. We imagined that our laborers would actually have to travel the globe. We would get into these insects and go to India. Because we didn't quite yet have the internet, we didn't have the ability to outsource, and we didn't have the call centers that are now answering our phones. This was intriguing to me about your graph on the screen usage. I don't know if anyone noticed this, but Indonesia and the Philippines were the highest on the list. And I, would have, I was looking because I thought the states will be the highest. Everyone glued to the TV. Is this their work in call centers? I mean, I can hardly imagine how one would only spend leisure time on this screen. So these are intriguing things. I'm always very intrigued about the background stories behind the graphs. Why are the Philippines above Germany? Now the idea of adapting technology to people instead of people to technology led to many kind of interesting visions that were very specifically ungridded. We'd have big infrastructures that we could start plugging in our homes, or our lecture halls, our temporary art centers. And in fact, the unit of time became involved. So this is a cross-section through the plug-in city. And in the cross-section, you'll see that there are tubes for travel, waste, that kind of thing. But they have specific units distinguished. Shop units, there will be uh, dwelling units, uh, universities were incorporated in this, and each would have its own time frame. Dwellings would be replaced every five or ten years because really, who doesn't want to join us in the fashionable? And at the same time, university lecture halls, they could last for 20 to 30 years because we're all so slow. It would lead to something that became a consumable object, capsule homes, which more or less were realized at some point in Japan. And which one might argue right now, in the micro-hotels in Asia, are physical realities. Only at that time, they were still kind of very cheerful, optimistic visions. To the left, you'll see, you know, the, the lounging lady on the bed, uh, showing how exciting it would be to constantly transform our environment and to adapt it to who we were wanting to become, if not already were. Now, in this case, for example, the, uh, the quote below was a kind of advertisement for the project we just saw, the capsule tower, where they specifically said a technological society, and this goes to the heart of sensibility, more people will play an active part in determining their own individual environment. And this was the core of Constant's utopian vision in New Babylon. Pieces of the city of New Babylon, the structure, would be constantly reconfigured. There were elements that one could build up. It would drift above the plane of the earth. 
And the idea is that our current laborers, who are constantly being beaten down by factory work, would take on this possibility to determine their environment, this artificiality of the world, and restructure themselves. They would determine their environment, they would reform themselves, and they would change their societies. Now, in New Babylon, interestingly <coughs> enough, as dystopian as this image is, is visually, <laughs> the idea was also that the sectors would be adapted to moods. It was not just about structuring your home, but it was also about having a place where you could be melancholy for a day or two, where you could be brutally dis depressed, or be completely excited <coughs> in showing something new. And on that level, these early visions of the 50s and the 60s were really fundamentally resisting the idea that we were machines, but looking for a human logic underlying technologies. And looking for a way that technology itself could begin to form around the human. For constant, for example, what that meant, and I'm going to have to translate, I guess, for the non-Dutch speakers, on the, on the right, he was dividing these atmospheres. So the, the box there is this moment, as we would see in New Babylon, you know, the yellow sector or the sad sector, the uh, ebullient sector. He would increase, he would show these atmospheres. This, the structure of the technology itself was meant to reinforce that through artificial lighting, through smells, through sounds. And that was divided in three levels. Architectonisch, klimatologisch, psychologisch, still in the old spelling. The idea that the architectural structure itself, which leads to a number of specific areas, the climate, the interior feel of it, and the psychological impact of it, would all be formed by the different elements that the architect could choose, that the artist could convey, the pieces that we would give them. Would give them. And in those pieces, we would offer things to these poor, you know, working drones and encourage them to rethink who they were. It could emancipate them from the boredom of everyday life. Now, for constant, this could lead to very specific infills of certain sectors. They could be colors. They could be completely cut off from any external environmental factors. Or, in some ways, I guess, as Las Vegas casinos are, they could reproduce external climates and just leave them to constantly ex um, engage us with new stimuli. Now, this brings us closer and closer to the body, because the body is part of that structure. The technologies ask us to do something physically. They engage us not only with sight, as the modernists did, but with smell, with touch, with hearing. And by doing so, it brings us closer, that was the hope, to who we are. To who we are <coughs> as humans, as opposed to machines. For Archigram, that might relate to, it at a certain point, organic forms, bringing our spaces closer to our bodies. They imagine them almost as organs. Or, we might even start reducing our architectural spaces to the steam bath that would enclose around our body. Now this is not just one moment, this is not just one group. Um, films like Barbarella, one of the classics of the 1960s, rethought what it might mean if we reintroduced the body. Barbarella was a science fiction scenario where we had gotten rid of all that stuff that was about bodies. We had gotten rid of sex entirely. Everything was a kind of mind conceptualization. Everything was lodged in the brain. Barbarella herself had learned the actual act of sex. I mean, this is the 60s, we're experimenting a lot. The actual act of sex in Barbarella was to ingest a pill, touch each other at the hands, and that would lead one to orgasm, purely brain. At the end of this scene, her hair pops into a curl. <laughs> and you'll notice she's naked, because actually, she's looking for the original sword. Now, 
This all goes to the idea that the closer we get to our body, the furs and the pricklies that are throughout that whole film remind us that machines are not the perfect paradigm for us. But that took a life of its own. We went from control and choice to being forced to make choices constantly. We hoped that the possibility of plastics would exceed those of concrete. We hoped that inviting our bathtubs to form ourselves to our bodies, this is the house of the future by the Smithsons, or introducing doorways that would remind us that we're kind of living in a cave, would help us come closer to who we were. And instead, the Monsanto house, we ended up encouraging corporations that would end up with genetic manipulation of corn. Or we ended up expressing ourselves in different colors of refrigerators. <laughs> and in a way, I guess that's the one question I would like to raise for this pavilion, for this day, in terms of work, in terms of body, in terms of leisure. All the ideals that we had seen as architects in the 60s, they kind of led us down a path that we don't really talk about so much anymore. Where architecture disappears, and the body disappears too. This is Rainer Manham himself, photographed in this thing they called a transportable standard of living package. And it was a proposal by Francois Delacret that at a point where everyone pretty much had everything they needed, so what do you get? the person who has everything they want. I think this is the contemporary question we all suffer through. You get them the transportable standard of living package. Your stereo, your bubble, you go out into the world, you go sit by the campfire, and there's none of that smell, smoke, ashes, and mess. None of that nastiness. We don't like that kind of thing. We don't like being reminded that the body is imperfect. Mike Webb, offered us a cushical, a portable environment. The idea that as long as you had your little video screen and a bubble that could blow up around you, you could backpack wherever you needed to go. And in fact, they actually experimented with these inflatable suit homes. And if you do it well, you could even actually share these things. You can zip on to one another. And closer as we get to the body, the further away we get from architecture, and all of a sudden our new technologies <coughs> are allowing us to think about just projecting new environments. We didn't have the World Wide Web yet, but they were all ready to take the classic English suburb, land a little circus event, and excite everyone for a few days. Archigram was all... Sorry, let me go back one. Archigram was all ready to bring a holographic scene setter to every environment. It didn't matter anymore if you lived in a boring brick house. Because the party was just portably in your pocket. And talk about your kind of prophetic gestures. Uh, the proposal for the electronic tomato, nobody actually knew what it was meant to do. <laughs> but it was meant to excite every nerve ending. It was meant to plug in, you'll see the little dots on her wrist. It was the iPod before we ever got there. But it does kind of bring us back to the question, the TV helmet, of whether we're kind of closing off from the rest of the world in favor of the holographic scene set. And actually, I have a slightly different version of the same image you have, whether we're really left with just the face, just the screen, and just the interface. So the question I suppose to me, for you, as architects, I have the freedom to say, not my problem, just looking at the conditions, is if it is true, what McLuhan already envisioned in the 1960s, that the medium is the message, that anything we do, any kind of prototype, any kind of prosthesis, which one would argue that all of these screens, lights, things, the original ones in glasses, if all of those lead to us changing, what is the change we want to see? What is the change we can help 
configure? It's perhaps a little utopian as a question, but I think if we take on the humility of realizing that every grand environment we've configured so far has not quite led to paradise, but just take on the possibility that our small triggers might offer small effects, then to me, actually, the exhibitions like we see right outside, where we're looking at logics of nature, inventories of effects, touchable, smellable, hearable things that we can intervene in, to me, that's a question that is absolutely worth dealing with today. Thank you.